All right, well, let's get going. We got uh, some good cases for you guys this morning. So, got a few little pieces here. Who wants to give this one a go? Uh, but let me just go ahead and start with uh, the fact that we're looking at a punch biopsy. Good. And then, <laughs> so for those of you who didn't have quite the courage that, that Kieran had, um, that's what you do when you get this. And you're going to get this on the board, so you may as well go ahead and start practicing putting yourself in the firing line now. There's an old saying, bleed in practice, sweat in battle. And I like that that little statement. So here's we're, in, we're just in practice now. We're, we're just training. We're not actually in battle yet. So when you get in a battle, I don't want you to feel nervous. I want you to say, oh, I've, I've done this already. I've already been through the, the fear factor. I have just basically now look at this and I can look at this and move right ahead. So yeah, first thing you do is just say what you can see. It's punch biopsy. Everybody's right about that. If you're if you're addicted to being right, you can always be right by just looking at something and just describing it. So the second question: What part of the body do you think you might be on? This seems like it's probably the the scalp. I mean, it's hair bearing and herb. Absolutely hair. excellent. And notice that there's a lot of hair follicles rooted down in the subcutaneous fat so in general if you get like something in another hair bearing area like the face you don't really get the hair follicles rooted that deeply down and also notice that there's a minimum of sebaceous lobules so that would favor the scalp over the face for or the you know like the face the beard area something like that so that's good all right and notice another thing here what, what is the way that this biopsy was processed unfortunately there's a tear over here it's not the world's best uh, microtomy, but what did they do here? Like at different angles, the, the cuts? Yeah, they did a punch. I think what we always recommend in, in this scenario is doing a punch, well, two punches. One's like a three millimeter, two three millimeter punches is really, I think, the best way to go. One for vertical orientation, one for horizontal orientation. And this wasn't uh, they, said they didn't get a very good grade on the on the histology here, but you can see they tried to do that. They probably tried to bisect it and then submitted half of it horizontally and half of it vertically. So is this an inflammatory or neoplastic process? Uh, I'm leaning more towards inflammatory. There's the dark blue cells and sort of throughout good. the dermis, there's little groups of them. Yeah. Okay, so there are dark blue cells, and you obviously know what those are, right? Lymphocytes. Yeah, lymphocytes. And where are they located? Well, and this I mean, is kind of like, like follicular, peri follicularly, maybe. Yeah, good. This is this is the site of a follicle. Unfortunately, it's kind of cut tangentially. And then let's look at these other follicles. Okay, do you see anything about these at this power? Uh, it looks like there's multiple shafts per follicle. I'm... That's very good. Yes, there's, yes, exactly. Probably what's actually happened is here, there may have been multiple follicles that are kind of affected by this, the same inflammatory process, or and they kind of group together, forming what clinically people refer to as doll's hair. So if you're seeing those little dolls that, you know, little girls get for Christmas and whatnot, they have these little, you know, four or five little plugs of hair coming out of these things, and instead of just one hair shaft coming out. So that actually happens in certain inflammatory alopecias. Okay. What else do you notice about this? Well, they're, they're empty. <laughs> they are empty. The hair shafts are gone. What's this material here at the at, right at the outer part of this little sort of cluster of these things? And I'll find another one over here that's maybe even better. This, this one's perfect, actually. It's a beautiful area down here. What are we looking at right here? Well, different. These look more like, uh, I can't tell if they're histocytes or fibroblasts. Yes, like these are fibroblasts mostly. There, probably, there may be a few histocytes lurking in here, but the majority of these are fibroblasts. Notice, so what's the kind of orientation of these fibroblasts here? They look like they're engulfing the... Yeah, it's kind of a concentric area. Exactly. So this is perifollicular fibrosis. This is cut. It's kind of cut cross-sectionally a little bit here. You can kind of see that. 
And so you can imagine this is almost like a, a straw, a cylinder surrounded by the, all this fibrosis. So you can think of a cylinder of fibrosis around the follicle. That's really, if you look up in this area of the top again, it's really centered mostly kind of around the infundibulum of the follicle. This is a classic location for where this inflammation is targeted. Okay. So I told you it's an alopecia. So obviously an inflammatory alopecia. Is it likely to be, is it a scarring cicatricial alopecia or non-cicatricial alopecia? Uh, I mean, if... Don't since there's still what was that don't overthink it we just said there's like a fibroplasia surrounding it so by definition oh, okay <laughs> so yes scarring then, huh? scarring yeah so cicatrizing or scarring and virtually all of the scarring alopecias are permanent you know we always talk about permanent and non-permanent i think that that paradigm may be changing somewhat because now we used to call androgenetic alopecia kind of permanent or and, you know, alopecia areata, alopecia universalis, that can be permanent. Well, not anymore. With jack inhibitors, you know, they can take people with alopecia universalis and regrow their hair. So I think we probably should get rid of the, uh, you know, non-inflammatory permanent alopecias. I think those those are probably not permanent anymore. They may be longstanding, but, but we can regrow those hairs now. But we get permanent alopecia when we get cicatricial alopecia. And notice where this scarring is located. We talked about being peri like the infundibulum, the isthmus of the follicle. That's where the stem cells live. And so when you get inflammation and scar targeting that area, it's never coming back. It's gone. It's it's permanent scar. You ain't going to re revitalize this yet. We don't have the ability yet to reverse this kind of scar tissue that forms around the follicles. So what's the most likely diagnosis based on this? I don't think, I don't think I've been through these yet, but um, uh, there's like a, a couple of the non-scarring alopecia would be like lichen planum pilaris. Or, right, wait, is that a non-scarring or scarring alopecia? Um, I thought that was scarring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said non-scarring. I think it's mis misspoken. Yeah, non-scarring alopecia. Lichen planum pilaris, probably the most common of the so-called permanent cicatricial scarring alopecias. And tell us a little bit about where the scarring occurs in lichen planus. Um, I'm not sure. Right here. You're looking at it. So right here. This is like a sniper rifle shot. It targets this area of the follicle. The lymphocytes just zoom in there. They don't go to the base of the follicle. In the, in the bulb, like in alopecia areata, they like the stem cell area. They like the, the infundibulum, the isthmus area. They go there, they hone there, they cause inflammation there, they turn it into scar tissue there. It wipes out those stem cells. So that when those cells, you know, normally uh, your follicles go through the antigen, catagen, telogen cycles. Well, you know, in those, in those stem cells that are left there, the ones that restart the, the new cycle, well, they're gone. They're killed. They turned into scar tissue. So you can't do it anymore. So that antigen, telogen, uh, cycle is gone. Boom, finished. So you're just left with these residual zones of scarring right at the sites of where those follicles used to be. It's, it's just classic. And so this is beautiful example of lichen planum pilaris. Now, just so you'll know, the other two, there are two other alopecias that target the follicle directly like this in this fashion. One is uh, Frontal fibrosing alopecia, which I personally believe, and it's, it's a belief, and you know, people have the right to believe whatever they want to believe, and I have good reasons for believing the way I do, because histologically, it looks virtually identical to lichen planum pilaris. And the other one is central centrifugal alopecia. That occurs, you know, or follicular degeneration syndrome occurring most commonly in African-American patients that use products on their scalp, and they get inflammation that targets this area of the follicle also. And my theory on that is that that's probably lichen planum pilaris or some variant thereof in that patient population that basically just gets kebnerized because of all the things that they do, the straightening, the pomods and all those various things. A lot of people don't agree with that, but the people that don't agree with it aren't histopathologists. So they don't see that it looks virtually the same under the microscope. And to me, when something looks the same, 
is very likely got a very similar pathophysiology. So this is lichen planipolaris, beautiful example of it. Uh, these multiple little hair shafts within or the little follicles that sort of cluster together. It's a pretty, it's a good clue to the diagnosis. It's not pathognomonic, as you can see it in the other conditions as well. But this is a nice example. So notice the scar here is right here. In, hydrod in things like hydrodynitis sepurativa and dissecting cellulitis, the scar is diffuse. So you get a separative process that's sort of like an invasion. It wipes everything out. It's not targeting the follicle specifically. You get folliculitis that then ruptures and just sort of forms a sea of neutrophils. It just sort of wipes out the follicles. It's a different type of scarring alopecia. So when it's the, the scarring that targets the follicle specifically, think of lichen planipularis like this. This is a good example of that. Okay. Very likely could be on the board examination. All right. I can take this one. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it so, uh, looks like it's a punch biopsy. Um, nice. Good. And then, uh, you know, just like from scanning, it looks like there's um, like these, it looks pale, like there's these pale cells um, kind of clustered together. Um, when we zoom in, um, it Before looks like we zoom in, we, we like to sort of resist the reflex to go too, too high too fast. So yeah. we, we like to learn as much as we can at the low magnification. So you're right. Everything you said so far is absolutely correct. So do you think this is likely to be an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? Or I think inflammatory. Sure? inflammatory. inflammatory. Yeah. Okay, good. If it's inflammatory, what's the pattern of the inflammation? It's more dermally dermally placed, uh, I think granulomatous. Okay. Is granulomatous a pattern itself? Or is it sort of a subtype that you can see in a several different patterns of, of inflammation in the dermis? More of a subtype. Yeah. So what's the pattern here? Just so we see. So you're right. It is granulomatous. That, so that's, that's correct. But what's the pattern of the granulomatous inflammation in here that we're looking at? And that's kind of important in a way. It's, it's a helpful clue that you can then use when you go to the next power. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's more it's perivascular good. only. Is it just superficial perivascular? Is oh, it it's more diffuse. Like yeah, that. good. It's very diffuse. Notice how the virtually the entire dermis is involved with this thing. The entire dermis is involved. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of granulomatous disorders that we see that, that don't give you that diffuse involvement. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. kind of helpful in, in the diagnosis. Yeah. All right, so good. So you think these are histiocytes predominating, nodular and diffuse, or just diffuse, a little mm -hmm. higher magnification now. And so these are histiocytes. Mm -hmm. Now, how are they arranged? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't see any necrosis or anything. Like I classified as non-caseating. Um, they're not really <laughs> centered around um, like any specific like material or anything. Um, well, what do you what do you call this type of granulomatous inflammation when you see these these round nodular little aggregations like that? What what type of granulomatous inflammation do we refer to that as? Because you're right, it is granulomatous. Yeah, I mean, a very slight amount of lymphocytic infiltrate around it. Yeah, I mean, I would call it non-caseating. It is not caseating, um, but that's not one of the classic five histologic um, patterns oh. of granulomatous inflammation that we see. So you, you know what this is, but you're just not saying it. I mean, we... you, I mean the five type, you can have sarcoidal, tuberculosis, yes. separative, palisading, foreign body. So this is sarcoidal. Right. You're right. Which of those does this fall into? Sarcoidal. Yes. Perfect. Sarcoidal granulomatous dermatitis here, diffuse sarcoidal granulomatous dermatitis. So what's the most likely diagnosis? So, um, I mean, I think sarcoidosis, but it's also um, a diagnosis of exclusions. So I would make sure that, you know, I, I get infectious stains to rule out um, like, you know, mycobacterial infections and also get um polarizable light just to make sure there's no foreign bodies but um 
I would at the top of my differential would be sarcoidosis. Yeah, you're exactly right. And those those other things are good points. Well, let's talk about a couple of those. So what's something that militates I would say of those that you just mentioned, probably the number one that can give you this degree of sarcoidal granulomatous inflammation in the dermis would be one of the a foreign body, like a polarizable mm -hmm. foreign body, mm -hmm. uh, especially to silica. Yeah, silica. Silica is glass. So if somebody gets in a car accident, they get a shard of glass in their skin and maybe it doesn't get taken out and they come back a few years later and they got this nodular infiltrate, you take a biopsy of it and it looks kind of like this. But there's a clue here that would tell you that it's more likely to be sarcoidosis than a polarizable piece of glass here that caused this inflammation. And, and this is sort of a an advanced question. So you, you may not know the answer to this, but do you know what is a clue looking at low power that might say, you know, it's more likely to be sarcoid than glass because there's not this finding that we would like to see if it were glass in the skin. Is it like calcium deposits or? That's a good try, but no, actually. Uh, does anyone know? You may not know, and that's okay if you don't know. That's perfectly fine. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a clue. So when you make a slide, a glass slide, what you do is you make a paraffin block or whatever kind of, some people use plastic embedding these days. And, and then you take it and you take a very sharp razor blade like uh, blade and you take that block and you, you cut across the blade like this. And so what happens is that blade is, is the tissue's moving across that blade. And if there's a piece of glass in here, it will tear the tissue. It actually just will form a little, like a, a rip. So you'll see a low magnification, these little rips like this. And you say, oh, you know, well, maybe the histotech had a bad day. But no, in that case, they had a good day. There was just some glass in there that tore through it. So if you see tears like that at low magnification, instantly think, you know, maybe this is a, a, a foreign body reaction. And then go to higher magnification, look and see if you see any glass particles. And you can actually um, polarize it, like you mentioned before, that glass silica is a, is a molecule, it's a crystal. So it will polarize, uh, so you'll see that. And what's interesting is some people that actually have sarcoidosis, they get in an injury like that and they get the glass in their skin and they get a sarcoidal granulose reaction. And sometimes their pulmonary sarcoid flares up. So mm -hmm. it's almost like it, it causes their immune system to get activated and it flares their sarcoid in, in you know, places that are far removed from their actual site of injury. So that's kind of interesting. We see that sometimes with sarcoidal granulomatous reactions to tattoos, which is another thing that can give you a nice sarcoidal granulomatous reaction like this. Now, you also mentioned AFB infections. Um, which AFB infection gives you sarcoidal granulomatous inflammation that can really look a, a lot like sarcoid itself? Yeah, I mean... For the mycobacterial, you can get more. Um, which I wouldn't say tuberculoid because that's more caseating necrosis. So like non-tuberculoid. Well, actually, actually, no, <laughs> you're right. Oh. <laughs> tuberculoid leprosy, tuberculoid yeah. disease, gives a sarcoidal histologic pattern. It's kind of the opposite of what you would think. You'd say, well, tuberculoid should be central caseation degeneration. But that's what you see in tuberculosis. In, in the atypical mycobacterial infections, those give you the caseation degeneration, the central degeneration of the histiocytes and some collagen there. Uh, but actually in tuberculoid Hansen's, you get sarcoidal granulomatous inflammation. So to remember, it's kind of the reverse of what you would think. So the tuberculoid goes with tuberculosis. It doesn't really go with tuberculoid Hansen's disease. So, and that, and that also, also uh, tuberculoid Hansen's disease loves nerves so it's usually mm -hmm. kind of elongated, teardrop-shaped granulomas mm -hmm. in the skin, tuberculoid, because it's following those neurovascular bundles. It doesn't really give you this really diffuse pattern like this. The diffuse pattern is usually seen in, in uh, the prominence hands disease, but that doesn't give you sarcoidal inflammation. It gives you more foamy histiocytes here. So uh, you also mentioned doing special stains for fungi and AFB and things like that. What's the likelihood of a positive result when you get this much sarcoidal granulomatous inflammation in, in a lesion? 
I think it's low. It's a low likelihood, but um, it's oh. just yeah, it's very yeah. low. It's it's almost a waste of time. Yeah. You're right. It's yeah. extremely low. When you get this degree of of immune response, even in patients that have well known obvious Hansen's disease, they've got the nerve involvement, they anesthetic, they don't sweat, all those various things. You stain it for organisms, you ain't gonna find it. Just you're you're not gonna find it. You have to do PCR. Mm -hmm. Even then, it may be difficult to find. Mm -hmm. So. When you have a brisk immune response like this, more likely. One last clue that we're dealing with real sarcoid, it's probably a dark skin patient, African-American patient. Mm -hmm. that is that. It's obviously more common in that, that setting. Mm -hmm. so, beautiful example of sarcoid. So that's great. Very good. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Some nice inflammatory skin diseases for you guys this morning here. Okay, this one's um, challenging. So sometimes when I say challenging like that, that you should say, ah, that's good news. That means that he doesn't expect me to get the right answer off the bat. I'll expect to get the right answer anyway. I just mainly want you to go through and apply an approach. So when you're actually on the exam, when they look down at the four choices, you'll choose the one that makes the most sense because you've worked through it. And that's the way that they work through the cases also, by the way. I mean, they... I used to write questions for the board, and that's what we would do. We want to make sure it's, they're fair. They, they can't be argued. So somebody take this one and walk through, and then we'll see if we can come up with a reasonable differential diagnosis and which one we think is the most likely diagnosis. I can take this one um, from Kirksville. So um, based off low power, looks like we have a uh, punch biopsy um, in the top section, it looks like we're seeing some um, fat a little bit higher up, so maybe more distal extremity here. Also seeing some hair, so like a hair-bearing surface as well. Yeah, that's um, probably the trunk or proximal extremity biopsy. That's, that's where the vast, vast majority of biopsies that we take in dermatology, if we can. We don't like to biopsy the face or the, you know, some sort of inflammatory skin disease on their face and their trunk. You're going to biopsy their trunk. So yeah, you're you're right. So that's the vast majority of, of biopsies. So do you think this is an okay. inflammatory or neoplastic process? Um, inflammatory, even from low power, I can appreciate um, more basophilic cells, like you know, kind of distributed through the um, upper dermis there. And yeah, you know, so yeah. What, what's the that. what's the main pattern that we're looking at here? Um, it looks more perivascular. Yeah, superficial perivascular dermatitis, which is unfortunately the most common pattern because that's got a long differential diagnosis. And when it's that long, it means that there are a lot of diseases that kind of look similar to one another. So we have to use secondary criteria to distinguish among them. So we got a superficial perivascular infiltrate. Cells are kind of dark and black. That means they're probably going to be lymphocytes. So now sure. it's fair to go a little higher magnification and see if they're seeing anything else. And do we see anything else now? Um, I feel like in the epidermis, there might be like very subtle um, sponge maybe. And then there's this obvious like pigment throughout as well. And then it looks like the basement membrane um, it looks a little like smudgy, so maybe a little bit of an interface going on as well. Yeah, good. I, I agree. Excellent. That's a good observation. I think there's some interface dermatitis here. Um, it looks like it's mostly vacuolar. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look over here, there might even be a few of these little sort of pink cells in the epidermis. Okay. So this one is a, a this is a tough case. So, you know, this is not one that you would likely see on the board examination unless they just this isn't a classic example of what the diagnosis is supposed to be here, but we can still learn something from it. So it's a superficial perivascular infiltrate of lymphocytes with some focal interface change, a little bit of spongiotic dermatitis. So what's the differential diagnosis? And there may be some dyskeratotic keratinocytes in here. So this has helped. This, I'm glad that you got this slide in the way because you're going to confront this pattern clinically lots of times. You're going to see patients that come in with, with eruptions that look like what this is going to show under the microscope. And so just because as you're going to struggle with the diagnosis and not be able to make a specific answer here, um, so too would the dermatopathologist struggle 
So you shouldn't expect him to come up with a specific diagnosis on something like this unless we have good clinical photographs and some good history and some things like that. So this is going to require a lot of clinical correlation to get a specific diagnosis in this case. So what's in the differential diagnosis of a pattern like this? Um, when you see interface, um, I think like a big um, category is like connective tissue diseases. Okay, yeah, you would, you would. So which connective tissue diseases in particular would you think um, about? I would say like dermatomyositis is one. I feel like that one tends to have more of like um, uh, atrophic epidermis from the ones I've seen, but, um, and then lupus oh, as well. Those, um, yeah, good. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Uh, and those are probably the two main ones that you would kind of throw into the differential on something like this. I agree, but I agree with you. You've got a normal appearing epidermal reedy here. So no mucin in the dermis, uh, no real marked thickening of the basement membrane zone, maybe a little bit of alteration here, but you know, so lupus dermatomyositis, Maybe a little less likely, but certainly you would put that in the differential. I agree with you. And then so you you look down at your requisition slip that the guy sent you, and this is a 65-year-old man and um, no history of arthritis or no didn't really feel bad or anything like this, and the process came up relatively acutely. Relatively acutely. So probably not connected uh, to you. What would be the most common? in that setting with this pattern. There are two diseases you can always say if you like to be right, and you'll always be right. <laughs> oh, are you going for like syphilis? Well? Yeah, <laughs> syphilis and drug eruptions, right? So in that right. setting, as I mentioned, a drug eruption, obviously. So probably in, in adults, we see interface dermatitis like this with a little bit of spongiosis, maybe a couple of dyskeratotic keratinocytes. It's kind of like drug eruption until proven otherwise. So that'd be the most likely thing in that scenario. But what else can give you this pattern? So this is why this is kind of important to work through this, because this is what we do every day when we see this biopsy. Right. And then we look down at our path slip and they say, X versus Y, and they're both give the same pattern. <laughs> so how do we tell how uh, do we get them apart? You know, the answer is kind of yes in that situation. <laughs> so you get vacuolar interface um, with like EM, graph, or toast, and fixed drug, but I'm not seeing. Yeah. Um, it's one's not as busy, and I would suspect, you know, with fixed drug, more EOS, um, possibly more pigmentary dropout. Yeah, um, those and then exactly graph, right. graphers, host, um, and like EM, um, you know, those necrotic keratinocytes, which there's, I'm not really appreciating a, a ton of those either. Yeah, this would have to be really super early erythema deformity, which can give you this pattern in some cases. And then graph versus host, it would have to be an acute interface dermatitis graph versus host process, which is fairly uncommon. Most graft versus hosts that we see are more chronic and lichenoid and sclerotic dermal changes, so that'd be less likely too. Um, there's one other disease that can give you this pattern also. I'll just spot you that answer, and that is viral exanthem can look like this. So never put down drug versus viral on a differential diagnosis. You know, anyway, we're not going to be able to help you unless you did a picture. Or you say something like, you know, a patient has fever and sore throat and whatnot and develop this eruption two days later, rule out viral example and say, yeah, probably is viral example. But if you say, you know, rash, drug versus viral, we can't tell that. And, and it, there don't have to be one single eosinophil. It doesn't have to be one. You don't have to any eos in a drug reaction. Well, I can tell you what, and the other couple of things that can look like this is, is pityriasis rosea can sometimes look like this too. That's kind of a viral xanthem, so that can look like this. And last of all, sometimes early pityriasis lichenoides can look like this. This actually is what this turned out to be in this case. This was a super early example of pityriasis lichenoides, not diagnostic here. So I wouldn't expect you to make that diagnosis just based on this slide alone. But sometimes you get early pityriasis lichenoides and it can look like this. It's got a little bit of this parakeratosis just starting up. But this is what happens if you biopsy pityriasis lichenoides probably at day two of its eruption. But this, the most important thing here is the differential diagnosis of the various things that give you this pattern and understanding the limitation 
of what we can do. And so your differential was really quite good. And that's the way that you should approach when you get a biopsy that looks like this. And when you submit it to the pathologist, understand if you put down things that look identical with no additional clinical history, you're not going to get back a specific diagnosis. So that's that's an important way to use the pathology uh, to its best advantage. Okay, I this... Think like this one. Okay, good. Uh, so it's a punch biopsy. Um, and um, on scanning, it looks like the... I guess the pathology is more in the subcutis. Um I guess yeah, like I would like say the... what you say more in the subcutis, a lot more or just a little bit more? I'd say a little bit more, like maybe yeah, dermis subcutis. Well, I'd say it's probably a 99% more. So here this is a lovely biopsy, by the way. Look how deep this thing is. This is thick. I'm not sure who did this biopsy, but they probably spent some time in the gym because they actually probably buried the punch all the way down into the plastic to get this deep. I mean, this is a beautiful biopsy. This is where the dermis kind of ends here. And this is where the subcutaneous fat and the fascia almost begin here. Yes, really, really a deep, deep biopsy. So it's really mm -hmm. magnificent. So the pathology is in the fat. So what's the yeah. inflammatory neoplastic here? I was inflammatory. Yeah. So what, the, what category of diseases are we dealing with here? Paniculitis. Good. And how do you approach a paniculitis histologically when you get that? Um, you want to differentiate, is it lobular versus septal? Yeah. And one thing I would say is kind of mostly lobular versus mostly septal. Just, you know, we, we write these beautiful chapters for textbooks and everything, and we say lobular, you know, septal and everything. But in the real world, there's also almost always some septal involvement when it's a lobular paniculitis. And the septal, mostly paniculitides, will spill out into the lobule some. So classic of the immunodosum, we call that a septal paniculitis, but there's always some periseptal inflammation in, in that condition. So it's just don't, don't get pigeonholed into thinking it has to be purely lobular versus purely septal. You can see these septal are marked and expanded here. So which of the two patterns did you think this really was mostly? Uh, I think it was lobular. Good. Lobular paniculitis. Okay, so when you get into lobular paniculitis, what's next? Um, well, I mean, there's many different like ones that you want to see. Um, you know what type of infiltrate it um, predominates, um, which I think uh, in this case is more. There was lymphocytes, um, but I also saw these uh, ghost cells. Okay. Um, before you, make, before you go down the lymphocyte category, notice the, remember the lichen planus case we had earlier where those cells around that infant were really super dark and black? Mm -hmm. Can you see these aren't as dark? They're certainly not histiocytes like the sarcoid we had, but notice yeah. that they're they sort of like maybe salt and pepper, I guess is the way you can describe it. There's, they're not quite as dark as lymphocytes. So that should tell you that, yeah, maybe these are neutrophils. You know, maybe they're not going to be all lymphocytes here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you, so you look at the type of inflammatory cell. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you look at to help distinguish the different types of lobular paniculitis? You said one thing a second ago. Uh, yeah, the ghost, the ghost cells. Yeah, you look inside. Are there any characteristic features of the lipocytes or the altered fat itself that's characteristic? So you said there's some ghost cells. We'll talk about that. What else do you look for when you're... Uh, trying to distinguish among the lobular paniculitides. What's the other sort of first step that you kind of do there when once you decided it's lobular? Um, I mean, you can look at the individual lipocytes and see if there's any, like sometimes there can be these like membranous, like feathery changes within them. Or that's, they can that's, that's true. You're, those are looking at the actual fat itself, but also look to see whether there's vasculitis or not. Mm -hmm. So if you have lobular paniculitis with vasculitis, that throws you into a different category mm -hmm. if there's no vasculitis. Mm -hmm. So here we've got no vasculitis, mm -hmm. right? nothing. So we're going to say, okay, well, let's take a look at the lipocytes themselves and see if there's any characteristics of them. And are and you said there are some characteristics. Yeah. So what characteristics are you seeing here? So yeah, these individual like ghost cells and like 
almost like calcium deposits in some areas too. Um, thought it would fit with pancreatic. This stuff is just ink over here. Yeah, now this is pathognomonic for pancreatic paniculitis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're right. That's exactly right. So you got the answer right. What about the cells? Um, Are we right at low power? Oh, uh, yeah, there's... Um, yeah, what kind of cells are these? These are red cells, extravasated red cells. What yeah. are cells are these? More neutrophilic. Yeah, neutrophils. Neutrophils. Why are the neutrophils there? They're uh, reacting to the, I guess, the, the ghost cells. Yeah. What are these ghost cells? What's this material that we've been uh, circling right there? What is the chemical name? Or the, let's talk about maybe the, the um, layperson's term for this. They said ghost cells. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of, I'm scared of ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason this I, I say that is because you can use the term ghost cells for a number of things. People talk about shadow cells, ghost cells, yeah. and, and polymetricoma. So, you know, you get the, these are, these cells have a very characteristic morphology to them. And there's a reason that they look like this. They kind of, I guess you could say they look sort of like ghosts, you know, they're, mm -hmm gray they got a white maybe a sheet that's flying through the the fat here <laughs> so what is this material here what's the chemical composition of this fat ghosty stuff that you described here you said there's calcium and there is yeah calcium yeah yeah so what's happened here um i mean it's basically just necrotic and fibrous uh, well, with not, like not, basophilic not, degeneration. Not exactly. So tell us about what happens in pancreatic paniculitis. So the good news is you recognized it. You got the answer right. Happy days. The sort of less good news is now you have to describe why. <laughs> why it's here. What causes pancreatic paniculitis? Is the sort of the sinuses can develop for no good reason? You know, there's a pathophysiology as to why this process happens. Um, basically, uh, you just get the necrosis of the fat. Um, okay. Why, like, why does it become necrotic? Just because it's fun? It just wants to die or it's old age? Um, and no, there's no vasculitis causing it, like it's say in, in you know, erythema neurotum, where you get ischemic necrosis of the fat. And you mentioned the membranous fat necrosis that you see with people that have lipodermatic sclerosis. That's also mm -hmm. low, rate, low, long standing ischemia that causes those changes in the fat. So here we've got another type of necrosis of the fat, but it's occurring for a, a particular reason. And the board will ask you why these guys get this process. That, that's fair game. Um, yeah, I mean, it stems from like a pancreatic disease. Um, yes, yes. So what happens when you get inflammation of your pancreas? Um, they, uh, I guess that the enzymes, um, yes. Can break down. yes, what enzymes? Um, well, you have lipase and amylase. Lipase. Li what is, what is lipase? Lice. Uh, it's fat. Yeah. Fat. So the pathophysiology of this process, circulating lipase, also get amylase too, but lipase, comes in, causes fat degeneration, causes the formation of, it causes saponification, soap, calcium stearate. This is soap in your skin. So can you imagine if you injected a little piece of soap into your skin right now, just because you were going to do a, like maybe an experiment, what do you think would happen? Um, like the same what we're seeing here. Yeah, you get lots of lots of inflammation. Lots of it would cause all these neutrophils to come in and all this stuff. So this really and truly is not an inflammatory paniculitis. Mm -hmm. It's a secondary paniculitis that occurs because of the lipase that causes fat degeneration causes calcium stearate. It's basically almost kind of like a foreign body reaction. 
that then all these neutrophils come in and leads to this classic pathic mnemonic picture. So this is saponification. So this is what we refer to these ghost cells that you're describing. This is actually, you're, you're totally correct. This is calcium that's, that's reacting with these long chain fatty acids that get released when these lipases come in and get and causes abnormality, causes the generation of the actual fat. So this is, this is a beautiful example of pancreatic pediculitis. So if you get this, you've got to find the pancreatitis. We had a case a few years ago where we saw this. They worked the patient up. They did the MRI and everything. They couldn't find anything. Turned out the patient had a tiny little fistula between their gallbladder and their pancreas causing a little low-grade uh, pancreatitis, very, very low amount of circulating lipase, but it was just enough to cause pancreatic paniculitis. So when you see this, it's pathic mnemonic of lipase being uh, circulated. You got to find it. So you got to got to find the pancreatitis. Very good. All right. This one. Uh, yeah, I can do this one too. Um, uh, it's a punch biopsy as well. Um, I think that um, I classified as inflammatory as well. Um, but I, I think um, from scanning, you can see that there's that um, almost like intraepidermal separation going on. I said almost, almost. Um, it's Can not almost. Do we need that extra word there. Can we get rid of that almost? I guess we can get rid of it. We can get rid of it. Yeah, it's <laughs> no confused. question. This is intraepidermal vesicular dermatitis. Excellent. So I'm glad you recognize that at low magnification. Very, very good. Mm -hmm. And then we know that these cells here are going to be the black lymphocytes, lymphocytes right? Yeah. Let's go to higher magnification. Now, once we're in the intraepidermal acantholytic vesicular dermatitis, mm -hmm. what's our next step there? Um, and then, yeah, you can see, um, I guess, which uh, the cells that predominate. Um, well, don't we want to look at the architecture of the epidermis? Yeah, and it's where that split is occurring. Yeah, so yeah, it's um. So there's three main places the split can occur, right? Yeah, in the stratum corneum, or occur way up here, yeah, and then yeah. it can occur way down here, mm -hmm. and then it yeah. can occur kind of throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we got a little bit of conflicting situation here, don't we? Yeah. This is Mother Nature again, right? Mm -hmm. The textbook's going to just tell you it's always this, okay? So mm -hmm. just like Dr. Freeman used to say years ago, there's lots of stuff written in textbooks, and a lot of it's correct. <laughs> but not all of it's correct. So mm -hmm. we see this. If we just saw this alone, what would we think about? Uh, you can think about pemphigus. Yeah, we think about pemphigus vulgaris. But if we see this, plus all this other area that's involved, where there's the majority of it, is this. Yeah. What um, that, right? What's this pattern? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it almost had the dilapidated brick wall appearance, like Haley Haley. It's the almost again. You uh, it it, it has. <laughs> it's it has. got the classic dilapidated brick wall appearance, which means there's diffuse acantholysis throughout the epidermis. These cells are just falling apart. Just like, you know, we talk about dilapidated. Lap means stone. So it means the stones of a brick wall are falling out of the, of the brick wall. So these look kind of like they're falling out of the, the brick wall of the epidermis here. And there's also a little bit of uh, dyskeratosis here, which is interesting. You see that in this, in this condition also. So what's the most likely diagnosis here? I would say Haley Haley. Yeah, you would say right. Haley Haley disease. So, and this is a good good example of that because it, it often you will see some kind of conflicting areas. You may see some some zones where it is just purely super basal. You might even see some areas where it's mostly kind of up in this area. Like for example, right here, it's just kind of in the uh, upper part of the epidermis. It's not throughout the epidermis. You may get a little bit of corons and grains, a little acanth, uh, some dyskeratotic 
uh, parakeratotic nuclei like you see with dairy age disease and with Grover's with Haley Haley. So you get a number of different patterns. So when you apply these criteria, you have to look at what's the predominant pattern, what's the most likely, and then couple it with the clinical appearance also. What do you think this would have looked like in the patient? Well, I think uh, you'd have had the, it's more like flaccid, but like you'd have these erosions. Um, yeah, it, it really uh, looks like, like crusted, crusted yeah. skin. Yeah. Some people talk about wet tissue paper. Yeah. That's a pretty good kind of mental image. And look at all this crust up here. Um, is there any dis any organism disease we might be looking for in here that might be associated with Haley Haley disease that might mm -hmm. make it not respond as well to tr a treatment? Like candida? Yeah, yeah. You look for candida. Sometimes you'll even look for herpes. Mm -hmm. You can get like Kaposi's varicelliform eruption. You can get secondary herpes virus infection occurring in here. I don't see any of that here, but yeah, and bacteria. So when you're going to treat these patients, you need to treat this stuff too. And then sometimes that helps with the acantholysis that's going on down in this area. So we won't talk about the genetic abnormalities associated with this. It is autosomal dominantly inherited, but make sure you know um, all of the various things that are associated with Haley Haley. They might show you this and say, the genetic abnormality associated with this condition yeah. is it, blank. It, it, yeah. it, 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 it. Okay, good. All right, so let's go to the next one. And they, somebody want to take this one on? Somebody that hasn't gone yet. It's not fair to have one person get all learning everything. I can try for this one. I kind of had a little differential for it. Um, so. Yeah, uh, so this is a punch biopsy. Um, I see a lot of dermis, so maybe kind of like back or um, yeah. proximal trunk. And then you see this kind of diffuse, um, it's either perivascular, superficial and deep, or interstitial. Um, I felt like it was a little bit of both. Good. Infiltrate. Uh, very, so. very good. Excellent. Very, very good observation. And that's an important observation. Important observation we'll talk about in a second. Okay, good. Um, and then it looked like, I mean, it's mainly dark cells. I'd say it's more inflammatory. And um, mm -hmm. when I went in deeper, it looked like mainly lymphocytes, although I thought I saw a couple of histiocytes as well. Okay. Uh, epidermal involvement? No epidermal involvement. No epidermal involvement at all. Good. Clinically, what do you think this looked like? Mm, I mean, it looks like there's a lot of fibroblasts. It's a pretty busy dermis there. Okay. Um, so maybe it looked more like a scarring, um, like an erythematous or patch or maybe plaque. Yeah, yeah. Why scarring? Um, because I see a lot of, a lot of fibroblasts, like a lot of collagen, it's kind of, or so maybe not scarring, maybe that was the bad word for it, but, um, like in that, like fibrosing kind of category. Okay. okay perhaps, but at least it's going to look like a pink, non-scaly, maybe urticarial papular plaque, no scale, probably going to no be. No scale, no epidermal involvement. Good. So it probably going to be on the pink side. Because it's got mostly lymphocytes in the infiltrate. So good. Mm -hmm. Let's go to higher magnification now. And your observation about interstitial is was quite good. When we start looking at this power, it almost like a mostly interstitial. Yeah. Mostly interstitial. There is some perivascular, I agree with you, but it seems like if you're going to weigh it, it's going to be like 80% interstitial and maybe 20% perivascular. So mostly. Okay. And let's look at these cells. Now you said they were, they were histiocytes and fibroblasts. Is there anything else they might possibly be when you start looking at them? You did say lymphocytes too. I mean, I, 
But what about the character of these? I mean, are these normal looking lymphocytes to you? They're a bit pleomorphic, darker. Um, yes. I didn't see mitotic figures. Okay, do you need to see mitotic figures? Is that? No. No, you don't need to. You can have the most malignant thing in the world with not a single mitotic figure. We see melanomas all the time that are, you know, three millimeters thick. They don't have any mitoses, interestingly enough. So let's go back and let's talk about the interstitial mostly pattern. And what diseases give you the interstitial mostly pattern like this? So you're going to have to kind of step uh, back instead of one answer that you're trying to come up with. You said you had a differential. So what is that differential of interstitial mostly conditions? So my differential was based on like perivascular and interstitial. So I was thinking like GA, NLD. Um, okay. For well, interstitial histiocyte mostly infiltrates. Well, here we've kind of got maybe some histiocytes, but it seems like we've got these sort of unusual lymphocytes here. And it's interstitial mostly. So, you know, so it's GA, interstitial GA is certainly one of the ones can do that. But what else falls into your differential? Um, like a, you could be thinking of a DF. Um, I guess like METs would do that as well. METs? Um, what kind of METs? Um, Breast cancer can do that. Yes, very um, good. Breast cancer very commonly gives you an interstitial, mostly diffuse pattern of cords and strands of cells diffusely in the dermis. Absolutely. Of course, it can also give you nodular aggregations, but that is a common form of um, ductal carcinoma of the breast that, that will tend to do the inflammatory carcinoma of the breast. What other things besides GA, interstitial GA, and that can give you an interstitial, mostly pattern? Uh, like a neurofibroma, you get like a busy not, dermis with mainly well, interstitial. No, uh, no, not neurofibroma. That's a so, it's a nodular solid lesion. So don't put that in there. We're talking about things okay. that splay between the collagen bubbles. So like interstitial GA, those histocytes are splayed between the collagen bubbles. Met metastatic breast like, carcinoma, splaying between okay. the collagen bubbles. Um, like a scleromyx edema. Yes, good. Yes, absolutely. Can do it. What about this um, disease? That has pleomorphic lymphocytes. Or pleomorphic, maybe they're not all lymphocytes. Maybe they're other types of hematolymphoid cells. Um... I feel like we're going down the malignant path if we're talking about atypical lymphocytes. We are. We are. And you've already oh, said like an, like an LYP or... Um, but that's usually more P. nodular or solid, right? That's not usually interstitial splaying. So think about when something doesn't normally go to the skin. It says, I'm going to think I'm going to go to the skin now. And it goes there and it, it's not like a solid, it doesn't sort of set up shop and form one nodule and then grow. It does like breast cancer. It sort of diffusely spreads throughout the dermis like this. What else? Are we, are we talking about like another type of lymphoma? Or another type of malignancy. That spreads to the well, skin. Well, it, it doesn't look like a DFSP. And that's not a, that's uh, not spread in secondarily, right? That's a solid nodular spindle cell neoplasm. So we're talking about this mm -hmm. mostly diffuse splaying pattern. So you said breast cancer. What else could be circulating in your blood and says, let's go to the skin and hang out for a while now. and gives you these pink multiple nodules through and their patients usually very, very sick. They're going to die this diagnosis, possibly. Uh, God, like a yeah, some sort of lymphoma. Or not a lymphoma. What's a, what's a cousin of a lymphoma? That gives you this like a diffuse. sarcoma. Well, not even, remember we're spreading to the skin. What if you did a blood uh, count? High. They got all these really very super high abnormal CBC. 
leukemia. Your bone marrow biopsy yeah. is abnormal. What are you going to call this? Like a like a leukemia? Yeah, leukemia acutis. Leukemia acutis gives you an interstitial mostly pattern. So just think about those lymph. There's those. It could, it's usually actually in this would be like AMML or something like that, but. Uh, CLL will often give you some nodular infiltrated lymphocytes, but when you get leukemia acutis, it gives you this interstitial mostly pattern. And it does have some perivascular because it's probably coming out of these blood vessels here. But when you get all these bizarre atypical lymphoid cells over here, or these might even be myelomonocytic cells. We might even do a myeloperoxidase and find out that these are actually maybe CD123 positive or myeloperoxidase positive. So this is leukemia acutis which is another cause of this interstitial mostly pattern. So when you think about that pattern, think about things like you said, interstitial GA, scleromyx edema, breast cancer, this, Kaposi sarcoma, cellulitis, gives you that diffuse interstitial mostly pattern. Uh, inflammatory stage of morphia can give you that interstitial mostly pattern like this. So this is leukemia acutis giving you that pattern. So good. You worked through it. You struggled through it. <laughs> you'll I never struggle. Long. Thank you for helping me with that. 20 years from now, you'll tell your grandchildren, oh boy, I had to struggle over that case. All right. So we're gonna use <laughs> this is what we call a Schnell diagnosis. This is a Thanksgiving gift. So someone want to do this in the last three minutes of our session this morning. I can try it. Uh, because you've been hogging all these answers. You're, you're just <laughs> too enthusiastic. Okay. Uh, you're, helping, you're helping your colleagues. They should be forced to answer some of these things. But I'll uh, let you do this since you're kind enough to volunteer. Uh, it's a shave biopsy. Um, Inflammatory neoplastic. Um, I guess I would say more neoplastic maybe yeah okay. said with confidence but uh, neoplastic yes. yeah but on your malignant um so i mean this is I think it's a more here's benign because it's well circumscribed yeah, absolutely well circumscribed small this is here's the, the power it's how big do you think this thing was uh it's Mm -hmm. It's like probably medium size. I mean, yeah, a few smaller size. Tiny dome shaped papule. Yeah. Small, symmetrical, beautifully symmetrical, well circumscribed. Yeah. What's the differentiation here? So uh, these are uh, these are nests of uh, melanocytes. Okay, good. Uh, um, so more acidic, benign. So what's yeah. the overall answer? So I think it's a Spitz nevus. Yeah. Nevus. If it's small, symmetrical, or circumcised, benign, melanocytic, it's a nevus. And then we say it's a specific type of nevus. So in, in 30 seconds or less, why is Spitz's nevus? Uh, you have the pagetoid spread, which you can see with the Spitz. And, uh, What's the other name for Spitz's nevus? Um, Sophie Spitz was a pathologist of... Uh, when an early dramatic pathologist, really a general pathologist, practiced at Columbia Presbyterian back in the 1950s. She actually died, I think, of ovarian cancer. Sort of sad. Oh, uh, Dr. Allen, who was an, a, a dramatic pathologist, wrote one of the early textbooks of dramatic pathology. And so she described this and actually it was named after her, Sophie Spitz's Nevis. It used to be called benign juvenile melanoma. Because mm -hmm. it occurred to kids and they actually thought it was melanoma, but it was a benign melanoma. Yeah, That's kind of a oxymoron, right? But we do know that a lot of these lesions that are spitzoid like this can metastasize to one lymph node and never kill the patient. So maybe she actually was correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the other name for it is the nevus of spindle and or epithelioid cells. And so you've got spindle and epithelioid cells here. This occurred in a kid. So this is a Spitz's nevus. And there's now we know that there are about 10 or 12 different histologic subtypes of Spitz's nevi that have fusions and all sorts of cool things that people have looked at. So this is a Spitz's nevus, beautiful example. This is not one that we would order any special stains on, not one that we would send to Myriad or Castle to be determined. We would not do anything like that. We would just call it a Spitz's nevus. We would not recommend excision. We would not call it an atypical Spitzoid melanocytic lesion. We're scared. 
we want to cover ourselves, we would just call this a Spitz's Nevis. And the kid would live happily ever after, just like you guys are hopefully going to have a happy Thanksgiving. So thanks, everybody. We got through seven, so we'll do those next two sometime in the future. And you always look at them on your own after the fact. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.